Well, take that stuffy art world. Who else but Banksy, the world's greatest street artist, would pull a stunt like that? Destroying his own work the moment the auctioneer's gavel came down. Pranks like that have made him world famous, and yet he tries to keep his identity a secret. He has to. His work is often, technically, vandalism. But it's also political usually on the side of the underdog, like this piece here on Israel's separation wall. Now, we're going to discuss all of this with our panel in a moment, including someone who owns a Banksy, someone who's worked with him, and a journalist who says after investigating for two years, she definitely knows who he is. But first, let's start with a quick look at his work. Renowned British street artist Banksy pulled off one of the greatest pranks in the history of the art world. Banksy, Banksy, Banksy sprung quite a trap after one of his paintings was auctioned off last night for more than a million dollars. And immediately passed through a shredder hidden inside its frame. Now the work is worth twice as much. Who is Banksy? This is just the most elusive character in the art world. His graffiti creations have sold for millions of dollars. For the better part of the past decade, Banksy has presented his pieces of political and social commentary throughout the world. He's saying, art world, don't take yourself too seriously. I don't take it too seriously, and yet I'm making millions of dollars from it. He's kind of laughing all the way to the bank. Banksy, who appeared in this 2010 Oscar-nominated documentary about his life, has never let anyone see his face. Ultimately, he can't show his face. If he's a, if he's a face, if he's a person, they can come arrest him for defacing property. Graffiti does ruin people's property, and it's a sign of decay and loss of control. You can't paint, you can't do your graffiti on public property. You can't do it. Graffiti is a crime, so nation, call the police if you see this man. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because the thing is, is they're here and then they're gone. After months of anticipation, Banksy's biggest exhibition to date, a play on Walt Disney's Disneyland. Welcome to Disneyland. Migrant ships on pools. That's right. The overturned pumpkin carriage of Cinderella. I mean, this is not for children. Banksy has collaborated on and reportedly financed a West Bank hotel. The view here, it is particularly special. We're right up against the wall that divides Israel from Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank. We did not have much tourists coming into Bethlehem. There were more Banksy tourists than Jesus tourists. Well, what a great character. And we have a great panel for you, as always, including the investigative journalist, Claudia Joseph, who spent two years trying to find out who he is, John Brandler, he owns a Banksy, the famous Port Talbot piece known as Season Greetings. But first, let's go to Darren Cullen, a street artist who has worked with Banksy over the years. Uh, Darren, good to have you with us here at the Nexus. Uh, let me start with this. Uh, how, did you, how did you meet him and how did you start to work with him? Uh, first met him mid-90s when he organised the graffiti jam in Bristol and he invited basically the best of the UK to head to Bristol and uh, fight out and see who's the best for the weekend. And we all did. We had fun. No one won, <laughs> officially. <laughs> right, sure. Um, it, would you say amongst your, your peers, he's regarded as the best or just the best known? He's, he's definitely the famous. Yeah. Uh, he's the best at what he does, which is stencil work. Uh, and he's done what everyone wants to do as an artist, and that is live off their art. Simple. True. And as a person, what's he like? Normal guy. Yeah. Normal guy, just wants to create. He's just focused entirely on his work, and he's, he's not looking for to be famous. I mean, well, I, I, you know, he wants his work to be famous, but he himself doesn't wish to be famous. 
Oh, obviously not. Otherwise, you'd have come forward a long time ago. But I think that's, 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 that's part of the charm, I think. Definitely. Yeah. What's your favourite piece of, of work from Banksy? It's got to be the one with the Damien Hurst spots and you've got the maid lifting up the wall. Yeah, we've got that here. So just explain, what is the symbolism here, then? I have no idea. <laughs> it's just a great image. Let's bring in John Brandon now. John owns the, the famous work at Port Talbot, known as Seasons Greetings. Um, John, what attracted you to this piece of work? It's, it spoke to me about pollution is universal. So the placing of this particular painting on the corner of a garage is phenomenal. How, when you look at it from one angle, it's the boy standing there in the snow, or he thinks it's the snow, mm. uh, with the, it falling on him, and he's got his sledge beside him. He's waiting to go sleighing. When you step back a little bit further, you see the brazier round the corner. I mean, a metre away from him, there's the brazier pumping out this pollution. And so he's standing there in the poisonous pollution that's killing him, and he yeah. thinks he's enjoying life. And then when you step back even further, and you can see above the garage, you see the, the chimneys of Port Talbot, which is, I mean, Port Talbot is famous for two things. One is steel mills, and the other one is pollution. And the so it's a phenomenal placing of the piece of art as well. So that, it, to me, shows, it encapsulates Banks's skill not only the art, but the placing of the art, how important the placing is in relation. That's why we're lending it. That's why we're creating an international street art museum in Port Talbot. John, the art is still in situ, I understand, and is being guarded round the clock. Is that yes, right? That's correct. It's in situ. It's, I, in fact, I got the plans this morning. We're moving into a building in Port Talbot so that it stays as close to in situ as is possible. And then it, we've got to put another a museum around it, basically. As I understand it, uh, Banksy isn't fond of people who take his art from the street and place it elsewhere, because, as you were just saying, it, it fits yeah. into the landscape. So how do you balance that, the need to protect it and to display it, with what you were just saying, which is that actually it fits exactly into the landscape as it is? The problem is that if you leave it where it is, you're going, the two things are going to happen. The pollution is phenomenal, right. so the pollution will damage it. The envi ordinary environment will damage it, and it's in the sad fact of life is that people will come and put tags on it to show that they consider themselves more important than the artwork. So every art dealer, every art collector, they can own a piece of artwork, but in my view, they have a duty of care to look after it. Graffiti, if you go inside the pyramids, you find graffiti. You know, that's four or 5,000 years old. So graffiti in itself is nothing new. It's yeah. whether it is respected or not. John, thank you. Let's go to uh, Claudia Joseph now, who spent two years investigating Banksy, trying to find out his identity. We'll get to that in a moment, uh, Claudia. But what I wanted to ask you is, during those two years where you were digging around in his background, uh, what did you find out about his background that shaped the man he is today, and perhaps even his art? Well, I think what was most surprising, perhaps, was the fact that he went to a, a relatively um, posh private school. And, and we all know that his references are very educated, but I think that if you look at his works, whether he's referring to politics or literary works or, or artworks, I, I think he, he's phenomenally intelligent and and i think that really comes across in his work which is perhaps why he's become so famous and do you have um, a favorite piece uh, i like quite a lot of them i, I like Pick one that i don't know kids with guns perhaps i like the juxtaposition of the the guns and and the innocence of kids and obviously obviously it's incredibly relevant nowadays with uh, you know is or with syria or, or wherever there are a lot of children nowadays fighting with guns um, rather than playing with them. Claudia, thank you. So now we've teased you enough. Who is he? Claudia thinks she knows. We'll ask her in a moment. But first, a quick rundown of the main suspects. Who is Banksy? In 2003, a journalist who'd interviewed him described him as white, scruffy and 28 years of age. 
He said he began working at 14 after he was expelled from school. He lived in Bristol in the 1990s before moving to London around 2000. Beyond that, sightings of Banksy suspects are rare. So, without much to go on, what are the best guesses? Well, theory number one. Graffiti artist turned musician Robert Del Naja, also known as 3D. The lead singer of Massive Attack and former graffiti artist was one of the founding members of The Wild Bunch, a Bristol-based collective of musicians active in the 1980s. But the pair have claimed to be friends, not the same person. On to theory two. I want to make bigger and bigger shows. Thierry Guetta, the French graffiti artist, as seen in Banksy's Oscar-nominated documentary, Exit Through the Gift Shop. The filmmaker turned street artist, also known as Mr. Brainwash, became the subject of Banksy's documentary in 2010. They were so, uh, so pleased with what they see, like they caught me as Banksy, and you know? like they, they said that I'm uh, as good as that. And has since made himself world famous, even designing the artwork for Madonna's Greatest Hits album. And finally, the leading theory, Robin Gunningham. Scientists at Queen Mary University of London say they've tagged him as Banksy by studying his areas of activity using statistical geographic profiling. Well, they're killjoys, aren't they? They managed to identify hotspots of Banksy activity and correlate them with locations frequented by the Banksy suspect. And in 1994, Banksy even checked into a New York hotel using the name Robin. A clear giveaway, or perhaps a classic Banksy double bluff. Let's go back to Claudia. Spent two years finding out who he was uh, for her article, which was published, what, about a decade ago now, Claudia? Um, it was published in 2006, well before the Queen Mary's piece. I think all they were doing was what I'd done before, which was um, looking at all the places that Robin Gunningham had lived. And, so who and is he? Who is Robin Gunningham? Yeah. Um, well, he's a, 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 a Brist he's Banksy. He's a Bristol Cathedral School boy. He is actually friends with De Del Nardo. I've got a picture of Robin Gunningham or Banksy with um, Del Nardo from Massive Attack. Um, so they are not the same person. Um, yes. He was brought up in Bristol, went to the cathedral school, left school as we know, and, and began working, um, tagging trains and, and doing graffiti. How did you, what sort of techniques did you employ to start to piece it all together? Well, I, I spent a lot of time trying to find out a name because people had lots of theories and eventually I found someone who knew, knew him who told me the name and, and once I had the name then there was a photograph um, that dated back uh, several years of Banksy doing some graffiti which had been denied um, and we went to neighbours, friends, family and, and a lot of people confirmed it. Um, if Robin Gunningham, who comes from Bristol, was not Banksy, he would have come forward by now and said, I'm a primary school teacher from Blackpool. Uh, well, let's go to someone who knows him and see if we can get confirmation for ourselves. I don't think you'll <laughs> squeal, will you, Darren? <laughs> there you go. He's expressed himself visually, as always. Darren, come on, you've worked with him. Is she right or, or not? No comment. No comment. So this, this isn't Thank the you, guy Darren. who squealed. <laughs> Could you just give John a chance here? So, John, you've been dealing in Banksy uh, art for, what, over a decade now? Yeah, and, I started in 2003. Uh, do you, have you ever met him? I might have met him at a friend. There was a family funeral for somebody, and I might have met him there. How does the mystique increase the value? And, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. So he, him being no. uncovered, it didn't alter the value of his work? None, well, not one bit. Isn't it odd? I mean, I'm speaking to you and it's all out there in the open and it doesn't affect the value. And then I speak to another expert who says the, the mystique enhances the value and nobody wants to know because it's like sort of unmasking Batman. What's going on here? Um, I think that there are a lot of people that are interested in creating stories because there's nothing else to do. I think that Banksy, nobody cares what Picasso looks like. Nobody cares what Rembrandt looks like, or Dürer, or Michelangelo looked like. Mm. And nobody does any research on that. It's the, today's publicity machine needs a story. And the, you know, the story is, what does Banksy look like? Really? Who cares? 
what's important and what Banksy wants to be known by is his art. Mm. That's his legacy, not his face. Mm. Um, I... Does it matter? No. Does money not matter? Money does, does money matter to Banksy? I think money is significant to him, but not important. It yeah. gives him money is, is, I mean, let's be honest, money is only a tool. You can't eat it, you can't sleep on it, it doesn't give you warm at night. All money does is show that you've made the right decision about something and it en enables you to do what you want. If Banksy hadn't had successful sales in the past, he wouldn't have had the money to set up the Waldorf Hotel in Palestine. Fair enough, we're going to get to that in just a second. Let's it up. Yeah, OK. Well, back in 2010, Banksy made a documentary, which we've uh, alluded to a couple of times. It's called Exit Through the Gift Shop. He didn't reveal his identity, but he did reveal more about his ethos. So then these famous auction houses, all of a sudden they were selling street art and everything was going a bit crazy and suddenly it all became about the money, but it never was about the money. Back to John. So, John, it's interesting, it's not primarily about the money, but he still enjoys a good income from his work. How does he get that income, even though he's this sort of mystery and enigma? Various ways. He sells the individual commissions. So if you are in a circle of his friends and acquaintances, you can commission a piece from him, which is a lot of money. You can buy from his agents uh, editions of prints. And when the prints or the paintings are resold, Sotheby's, Christie's, all from galleries like myself, when they, the items are resold, he gets a percentage of the sale. You mean the pieces that we see on the street that are taken and, and sold at auction, for example, he still manages to get a slice of that? Yes, he gets a percentage because it's called the artist resale rights, which were only introduced a few years ago. But the idea is that every time an, an artwork is sold, if the artist has died, is alive or has died within the last 70 years, he or his estate gets a percentage of the sale. It's the same principle as musicians being paid every time a piece of music is being played. But he, but he refuses to authenticate those pieces of art on the street, and yet he still gets the money. Why, why refuse to authenticate it, then? He doesn't want people like me coming along and taking the piece and put it on Fair enough. So stay with me for a minute, John. I just want to go back to that stunt that happened at the, uh, the auction house where he shredded the girl with the balloon there. Um, let's go back to John. John, I mean, you, you go to auctions quite a bit. <laughs> that was an amazing stunt. Have you ever seen anything like it? I have never seen... I mean, this is the point about Banksy. He comes up with ideas that nobody's ever had before. He is the, the most original thinker when it comes to art and, he, and marketing of his art. And what was his message? His message is, don't expect anything. And, and Darren, what about you? When you saw that, did you have a wry smile on your face? Yeah, very much. It, it was a big game changer. What do you think really his cool. message was? Summer beans for hire. Southern Beast for Hire, fair enough. Um, the weird thing is, though, Darren, it actually apparently enhanced the value of it, so perhaps that didn't have the, the intended consequence. I think he knew, or the, the, I think the team knew what, exactly what would happen afterwards. It's, it's a great, Absolutely. unique, original piece of artwork. Oh, so it did have the intended effect? Oh, of course, even, yeah. All right, so now I'm confused. He wanted to stick two fingers up the art world whilst at the same time enriching the person who bought the art. He's playing with the art world now. He, yeah. he can. Why Fair. not? Fair no, not. He, he wouldn't get hit. No one else is going to get a chance like he has to play with the art world. And the question is, who bought it? Because he would have known that by shredding it, it became the famous painting. I mean, this is one of 25 canvases he's done of the same image. Mm. So it, instead of being worth several hundred thousand pounds, it's now worth two or three million. So the question is, although it's allegedly a, an unknown lady that owns it. A lot of people think that Banksy bought it back himself because he knew the moment it was bought back, or bought, it was now worth many millions. And he wow. didn't necessarily want to give many millions to a total stranger. Well, that'd be a pretty smart move. Maybe you should get into the city. Uh, Claudia, when a, when a story like this crops up in the newsroom, all the journalists go nuts, don't they? Well, I think they, they like it. I mean, the reality is that... Um, we're used to Banksy stunts and, and there have been a lot of them. I mean, this was a surprise and everybody wanted to know what happened. Um, as John said, um, maybe his wife bought it. Um, she may have been the unknown woman. He may well have been in the back of the room laughing, you know, as everybody sort of put their hands up. But 
I mean, he plays games, Banksy. I mean, he's got a great sense of humour and ultimately, as long as having a political message, he, he very much wants to have a laugh, I think. Let's talk about his political message for a minute. You know, not big into materialism, very political, and always supports the underdog, it seems. For example, done a lot of work in the occupied West Bank along Israel's separation barrier, and even created the Waldorf, <laughs> the Waldorf Hotel, I should say, in Bethlehem, which he filled with art. These two angels trying to split the wall is an art of Banksy, who is street artist with activist agenda. It was 2005 when Banksy pushed its spray for the first time to this eight meters high separation wall of Israel that later turned into a big canvas for street artists after him. In 2017, he came up with the idea of hotel called the Waldorf with his artwork that rapidly became a rare success story despite Israel's attempt to curb tourist attraction to Bethlehem. He has uh, eloquently translated the living conditions of the Palestinians to the world in a, in a much um, um, better way than many um, politicians would do. So this is just to remind the world that, you know, bad things like this take place and they should stop. Curious stuff. Uh, Claudia, when you look at that work, this is obviously a man with a conscience. Definitely. I mean, I, I think he, he always fights for the underdog. He, he always wants to point out the ludicrousness of situations. I mean, he, he did the, the, the very famous picture of Rage fla um, Flowers Thrower. Um, it, 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 it's sort of making people question what they're doing and, and, and why they're behaving the way they do and, and hopefully raising um, awareness in, in, a, in a different way from, from the politicians who, who don't have much of a sense of humour. And, 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 in, and in his own country, in the middle of all this Brexit mess, he's been doing this work. Take a look there. There's a a man up a ladder chiseling away at one of the stars in the European flag. How would you, how would you go about even doing something like that, Darren? No, in his case, he's mostly uh, obviously planned ahead, erected a scaffold with uh, some covering around it, just like mm -hmm. any company would, uh, taking care of a building and paints away, covered. And then when they're finished, just take down a scaffolding, job done. Away. It's not obvious, though, what his opinion is of Brexit from the work, or is it? No. I don't think he tells... It, I, I personally don't think he tells as much anyway. <laughs> OK, indeed. Yeah, well, John, that's the thing. I mean, how much of his art is just there to provoke, your, provoke you into thinking, and how much of it there is there to express his opinion? Most of the things he does, he expresses a very clear opinion. He's against violence, kids on guns, he's, you know, various things like that. But the piece in Dover where he's, where he's an unknown character, you know, if he'd done Theresa May chipping off one of the stars, yeah. or he'd done Corbyn chipping off one of the stars, then it would have meant something. But to do just this, you know, is, is the character putting the, the... Is he trying to mend it? Is he trying to destroy it? Is he trying to destroy Brexit? That is, he's trying to destroy the European Union. It, it, it's, it's not a good piece. Do you see any new Banksies, or new, what I mean by that is new young Banksies coming up through the art world whose work is finding its way to your gallery? I hope I don't see any new Banksies because I want artists who are unique in their own right. I want every artist that paints, that I want the painting to be the signature, not the, not the pencil mm. writing at the bottom. So I see artists like the Connor Brothers. I see my dog, Size, who is phenomenal. Mm. He paints on everything from a, the end of a small tin can with two bristles right the way through. He did a painting in China, and it was nine stories high. Um, we see several artists, but the, I don't want another Banksy. And when, somebody, when people get in touch with me and say, I'm going to be the next Banksy, I know they're going to be rubbish. OK, because they're not original enough. Is that it, Darren? OK, well, look. Do you see, because I know you run workshops uh, for young people who want to get into street art, do you mm -hmm. see talented people coming up who have their own original take on street yeah, art? Yeah, all the time. Uh, so, yeah, I've been doing this since 1983, professionally since 1996. And we've been doing, I've been doing workshops with young kids since 1996. And we'd go into workshops and the teacher would 
point out the kids to watch out for, and the kid will be sitting there with the hoodie over their heads, and they say, watch out for this person. And within five or ten minutes of these guys interacting and engaging with this huge piece of artwork on the wall where there's no limits to what they can do, uh, these guys are talking, they're engaging. And these guys are doing great pieces of artworks within, like, within, within hours for the first time. Not many, but again, you'll see one or two coming out and, yeah, these are the guys to watch out for. I really do think so. Sage advice from Darren there. And John and Claudia also, thank you for joining us. We've uh, talked a lot about uh, Banksy and now we're going to finish the show with some of his best work. Thanks for watching. See you next week.